uh, you know, to, uh, to kind of re-emphasize this concept of the research cluster. Okay, so research cluster is not just you know some random webinar. You know, we have you know very a lot of webinars, but if you have if you have a research, we have to build a research cluster, and this is the second one that we have started. The first one was on a related topic of cloud computing with the leadership of Ravindra you know, Dasti Corp. Uh, so this research cluster on big data is the second one that we're trying. Okay, now let me explain before I introduce and before we get uh, Dr. Jasma to get started. Uh, the, the, the concept of a research cluster is to build a community. Okay, very important. Okay, to build a community of people who are doing research on big data. So it is not just having an occasional webinar. Okay, it is not just having an occasional webinar on the topic. That is not a research cluster. That is just a webinar, individual webinars given once in a way. Uh, but research cluster is a community where uh, all members of the community participate in different ways. Uh, some of them, some of you might have done good research in the field and you should come forward and say I will give a webinar. Even if it is for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 45 minutes, it doesn't matter. Okay, sometimes we can have two or three of you giving short webinars. Okay, in addition to that, there is a portal uh, uh, that we have created where we have posted, we post the recordings of the webinars. And, 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 and then create a discussion forum. Uh, we will invite those who attended these webinars to become members of that particular portal, that course, that community. And you have to be an active member of the community, not just become be a member and sit quietly. You have to participate in discussions. You'll be able to view the recordings of the previous webinars and add suggestions as to who should, what, the, what the community should be doing. So you as a community have to drive this process. You have to do this, make this happen. Uh, IUC, myself, and Sridhar, we only facilitate and create the environment, but you have to make it happen. Okay, so if you don't, then it will just remain you know, just a bunch of webinars, occasional webinars, which will be useful, but not extremely useful you know, for to build a community. So keep that in mind. Uh, we will have a discussion on this and, uh, after you know, after uh, Dr. Jasma gives a little uh, presentation, uh, so 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 Jasma, I would recommend that you you that you make a presentation for about 20 minutes and then take a break, okay, and 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 then yes. for a few minutes and then we'll have, we'll have to see if there are any questions and as well as that and then I will also talk some more about the building the uh, the research community, the research cluster. Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Everybody. Um, I'll give a web information and communication engineering. It is a professor. The department of I've also worked in Intel Corporation, Bangor of Engineering and PESID, which is now called uh, PES University. Um, I completed my doctorate degree from Anna University, which is uh, located in Chennai. Master's degree from uh, Vishweshwaraya Technological University, as well as bachelor's degree. And this is my uh, work uh, responsibilities. Uh, I have published in several reputed journals, uh, for instance in uh, the journal of uh, IEEE transactions on computers, Elsevier 
come to networks and applications and of course the journal Ajit journal the name of few my uh, h10 in Amazon to is 3 4 of uh, 5 point point six six Base and uh, I have done bitter technology for years. This is about me. Now, let us begin uh, the uh, presentation. Um, my research topic is big data, but I would want to use a BCI along with big data because the data that is generated using brain computer interface is huge and massive. So, that's the reason I feel that there's a need for big data technology to be used for uh, BCI. The agenda of today's presentation would be first look at the 2015 Gartner hype chart and then understand what brain computer interface is, what is big data and how um, big data can address the challenges faced by brain computer interface and finally research directions on BCI data using big data technologies. So the key takeaways from uh, today's uh, meeting would be at the end of this session you will be able to explain big, big data and BCI, map the need of technologies for BCI analytics, list the challenges faced in the field of brain computer interface and list some of the research directions on BCI big data. So this is the hype cycle for emerging technologies which was published in the year uh, just a sec, let me, okay, which was published in July 2015. So if you look at it, this chart gives us as to what is the uh, current trend in the uh, technologies. If I look at brain computer interface, it's here and this uh, yellow triangle indicates that in case I gain expertise on brain computer interface, then I can continue to, um, uh, the field would continue to be there for more than uh, 10 years before it uh, uh, reaches its uh, slope of enlightenment. Now if I look at uh, big data, I think it's somewhere here. So uh, this is an important uh, uh, cycle which is published by the Gartner organization and it actually gives us as to what is the domain that we need to choose. For those who are just putting their baby steps into research, this is very important. It gives us a clear idea on uh, for those who do not know what field to choose you can select it from here for whichever you have experience or you would want to gain experience on and the link is the link that I've referred I've listed it here so now let me uh, I'll just have a small video on what is it that I have achieved as on today on a brain computer interface
so the uh, video that we just watched was uh, a mind controlled toy car video wherein uh, through the thoughts we are able to move the car <coughs> excuse me, in various directions, forward, reverse, reverse, right, left, as well as stop. So this is what we did. Uh, I just started working on BCI in the month of November, and this project that we just saw was an undergraduate level uh, project. So now let us understand what a brain-computer interface is. It's also called brain-machine interface. It's a direct communication pathway between an enhanced or wired brain and an external device. So, if you look at the person here, he is wearing the uh, BCI cap and his brain signals are being read on a system. The uh, signals which are being displayed here is EEG, which is electroencephaly graph signals. So, now we'll have a quick comparison of the various uh, brain computer interface devices which are available in the market. Okay, uh, this is the name of the devices, Aurora Dream Headset, Melon Headband, iFocus Band, MindWave. The one that we just saw in the video, we have used uh, Neurosky MindWave Mobile. Then you have the MindFlex, Emotive uh, Epoch. Basically for research purpose, the uh, BCI headset which is most preferred is the Emotive Epoch. And then you have the Emotive Insight, Star War Force, so on and so forth. If I uh, look at the uh, SDKs, most of them provide us with the software development kits for us to capture the uh, brain signals and work on it. But as of now, the most uh, sought of the uh, BCI device is Emotive because it uses 31 electrodes to capture various brain signals. So going back to my presentation. Now uh, we look at a few of the brain computer interface devices. Start with Muse. This is the specification of Muse. It was released in April 2014. It has a Bluetooth interface and SDK is available. So if you look at the structure of Muse, it has two forehead sensors and three reference sensors. And then this is adjustable. And you have two smart sense conductive rubber ear sensors and pairing with two charging ports. This is another uh, uh, headgear. And finally, the headgear that uh, I uh, we used myself and my students is the Eurosky MindWave uh, mobile. So this has two uh, electrodes. One is the reference electrode, which is for uh, canceling the charges. And the other is the electrode, which is placed on the forehead. The electrode type is uh, FP1. This electrode is basically responsible for capturing the uh, cognitive uh, information as in the attention level of the student while the student is taking some activities and various other uh, parameters. So let us look into the Neurosky website. Okay, so one of the major disadvantages of this uh, uh, interface is that it, it only uses one electrode and we can only do whatever is possible through the data which is captured on this electrode and there are a lot of games and this is the uh, starter kit that we purchased the cost of this is around 10,500 it is uh, Bluetooth enabled as in you can uh, very easily connect this to the laptop or mobile, de mobile device through a Bluetooth uh, module and it also comes with uh, several apps for instance the brainwave uh, visualizer And uh, there is also a tutorial available on the mobile, uh, on the website, uh, through which we can very easily uh, kickstart our work on the uh, BCI part of it. So now uh, I'll give a very brief introduction on the types of uh, brain waves. There are four types of brain waves, gamma waves, beta waves, alpha waves, theta waves, and sorry, five types, delta waves. So this is CPS cycles per second. The gamma waves, uh, the cycles per second is 31 to 120. And for beta, it is 13 to 30. For alpha, 8 to 12. Theta, 4 to 7. And delta is 5 to 3. What is important here is to understand and differentiate between these uh, five waves. The gamma waves are basically responsible for uh, hyper brain activity which is very great for learning. So if students have a high level of gamma waves, then that means uh, they can learn quickly. 
then you have the beta waves here we are busily engaged in activities and conversations so if I look at uh, the learning styles active learners have uh, uh, high beta waves and then alpha waves very relaxed deepening into meditation theta waves drowsy and drift down into sleep and dreams and delta waves deeply asleep and not dreaming so these waves are used to classifying uh, for classifying the uh, mental state of the person and these waves can be captured through uh, various approaches. One of the approach is uh, EEG. It can also be done through ECG or uh, MEG. Now let us look at the uh, brain electrode locations. Here we have 31 uh, electrodes. What these electrodes indicate is the uh, data which is captured. F stands for frontal, C collateral and so on and so forth. The data is available online. If you just Google brain electrode locations, you will know. So on the brain, these electrodes are placed at different positions on, and they are responsible for capturing different types of brain signals. So if I go back uh, to the slide here, you can see each uh, dot here represents an electrode which is put across various parts on the brain. And uh, BCI itself can be classified in uh, into uh, non-invasive and invasive. In case of invasive brain computer interface, the uh, chip is placed uh, within uh, inside the scalp of the brain and non-invasive non uh, BCI, it is on the uh, uh, head which is uh, placed. If I look at the muse and the melon headband, you have to wear gel in order to place it on your head. Also, for in, uh, Neurosky uh, Mindwave, it can just be uh, if the electrode touches your uh, head, that's more than sufficient as in the forehead. But in case of emotive, again, uh, you have to apply gel on the hair and then put the electrode clap, uh, cap on the uh, brain. So let us look at what the functionality or is of each of these uh, electrodes. FP1 is for attention. You have F3, which is for motor planning. F7 for verbal expression. FZ, working memory, absent-mindedness, T3, verbal memory, and then C3, uh, sensorotomotor, and T5 is verbal understanding, P3 is cognitive processing, O1, visual, so on and so forth. So basically, the entire uh, brain is divided into four parts, and then the electrodes are uh, placed in the quadrant, and each set of electrodes which fall within that quadrant are responsible for... Uh, uh, performing some functionality. So uh, a BCI headset should have these many number of electrodes if this data has to be captured. Uh, in case of Neurosky Mindwave, it only captures FP1, which is the attention. Attention of uh, the person can be uh, measured. For the car video that we just saw, based on the attention of a, uh, the user, we were able to move it in the five, uh, four directions and also through meditation we were able to stop the uh, motion of the car and what is important is these three uh, two electrodes below T5 spelling and half is in between T5 and P3 critical for uh, reading so there are two reference electrodes which are also uh, placed which I will not be discussing now so now uh, that we have understood very briefly on what brain computer interfaces, I'll move on to big data so that we'll be able to understand why big data technology is critical uh, for uh, BCI. So we'll just watch a video on big data. Increase the volume just now a little bit. The quantity of computer data generated on planet Earth is growing exponentially for many reasons. Good. For a start, retailers are building vast databases of recorded customer activity. Organizations working in logistics, financial services, healthcare, and many other sectors are also capturing more data. And public social media is creating vast quantities of digital material. 
As vision recognition improves, it is additionally starting to become possible for computers to extract meaningful information from still images and video. As more smart objects go online, big data is also being generated by an expanding Internet of Things. And finally, starting to generate and rely on vast quantities of data that were until recently almost unimaginable. Big data is often characterized using the three Vs of volume, velocity, and variety. Here, volume poses both the greatest challenge and the greatest opportunity, as big data could help many organizations to understand people better and to allocate resources more effectively. However, traditional computing solutions like relational databases are not scalable to handle data of this magnitude. Big data velocity also raises a number of issues, with the rate at which data is flowing into many organizations now exceeding the capacity of their IT systems. In addition, users increasingly demand data that is streamed to them in real time and delivering this can prove quite a challenge. Finally, the variety of data types to be processed is becoming increasingly diverse. Gone are the days when data centers only had to deal with documents, financial transactions, stock records, and personnel files. Today, photographs, audio, video, 3D models, compact simulations, and location data are being piled into many a corporate data silo. Many such big data sources are also unstructured and hence not easy to categorize, let alone process with traditional computing techniques. Due to the challenges of volume, velocity and variety, many organizations at present have little choice but to ignore or rapidly excrete large quantities of potentially valuable information. Indeed, if we think of organizations as creatures that process data, then most are rather primitive forms of life. Their sensors and IT systems are simply not up to the job of scanning and interpreting the vast oceans of data in which they swim. As a consequence, most of the data that surrounds organizations today is ignored. A large proportion of the data that they gather is then not processed with a significant quantity of useful information passing straight through them as data exhaust. For example, until recently, the majority of the data captured via retailer loyalty cards was not processed in any way. And almost all video data captured by hospitals during surgery is still deleted within weeks. Today, the leading big data technology is Hadoop. This is an open source software library for reliable, scalable, distributed computing and provides the first viable platform for big data analytics. Hadoop is already used by most big data pioneers. For example, LinkedIn currently uses it to generate over 100 billion personalized recommendations every week. Hadoop distributes the storage and processing of large data sets across groups or clusters of server computers. Whereas traditional large-scale computing solutions rely on expensive server hardware with a high fault tolerance, Hadoop detects and compensates for hardware failures or other system problems at the application level. This allows a high level of service continuity to be delivered by clusters of individual computers each of which may be prone to failure. Technically, Hadoop consists of two key components. The first is the Hadoop distributed file system, which permits high bandwidth cluster-based storage. The second is a data processing framework called MapReduce. Based on Google search technology, MapReduce distributes or maps large data sets across multiple servers. Each server then creates a summary of the data that's been allocated. All of this summary information is then aggregated in the so-termed reduced stage. 
MapReduce subsequently allows extremely large raw data sets to be rapidly distilled before more traditional data analysis tools are applied. For organizations who cannot afford an internal big data infrastructure, cloud-based big data solutions are already available. Where public big data sets need to be utilized, running everything in the cloud also makes a lot of sense, as data does not have to be downloaded. For example, Amazon Web Services already hosts many public data sets containing government and medical information. Looking further ahead, quantum computing may greatly improve big data processing. Quantum computers store and process data using quantum mechanical states and will in theory excel in massively parallel processing of unstructured data. As I mean, and explain, big data provides an opportunity to find insight in new and emerging time. Or as Oracle put it, big data holds the promise of giving enterprises deeper insight into their customers, partners and business. In time, big data may also help farmers to accurately forecast bad weather and crop failures. Meanwhile, governments may use big data to predict and plan for civil unrest or pandemics. In a recent report, the McKinsey Global Institute estimated that the U.S. healthcare sector alone could achieve $300 billion in efficiency and quality savings every year by leveraging big data. Across Europe, they also estimated that using big data could save at least $149 billion in government administration costs. In March 2012, the U.S. government announced a $200 million investment in big data projects. By the end of 2015, Cisco estimate that global internet traffic will reach 4.8 zettabytes a year. That's 4.8 billion terabytes. It indicates both the big data challenge and the big data opportunity ahead. More information on big data can be found on explainingcomputers.com. But now that's it for another video. And I hope to talk to you again very soon. Just now, is this a good time to take a little break? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Uh, so this is this Krishna again here interrupting uh, this very nice presentation that uh, that Jasma is, uh, is has been giving. Uh, really impressive about the brain computer as well as the um, about looking at you know, brain control as well as uh, the big data and the connection. Uh, so, so we have you know, we have several participants here today, and I just want to quickly do a do a quick survey uh, because the, as, I, as I said earlier, I'm going to I'm going to quickly take 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 the control of, of the screen for just two minutes and give it back to you afterwards. Uh, in, in again two minutes. In the meantime, you know those of you who are participants who have questions for Jasma, please uh, uh, continue texting so we can read them out. Uh, as I said earlier, you know we're trying to build a community around this uh, topic of uh, you know, big data, uh, and 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 so community is not just having an Occasional webinar. It is about you know everybody in the group interacting with each other and doing their part uh, to build the community. Okay, so so there are two things that you know, uh, one thing that I'll do right now is, is, is do a quick survey of this community that has joined today uh, to get some idea what this community looks like. And then secondly, I will show you, uh, you know, what we are trying to do from IUC side. We can only facilitate, but so we created a, a you know, creating a portal where we have the recordings in, uh, in in each of these clusters, and then people can communicate and discuss but all this will only work if you are active if you're just observing and then and, and, and just going away uh, the community will not work so I've created a few polls and let me quickly I'll give 30 seconds for each of these poll and uh, and it and I want you to respond very quickly so that we get some general idea of what this community is about so uh, so the first poll I'm going to launch it says do you have a PhD and I just want to get some idea on that so I'll give you a few seconds the poll is open so please uh, uh, complete the poll So about 38 percent of you have voted. I encourage all of you to vote. Yeah, less than less than 43 percent have voted. I need to see more people voting. Okay, we need more information about the community that has gathered here today. So please take the poll, click on yes or no. 
See, the community means has to be a community has to be active. You can't just be a passive you know, in the background and and, uh, and and not be part of the community. A community you know, needs to be engaged. Uh, so that is one important requirement of building a, a community, a research cluster community. Uh, so it, it looks like uh, you know, only half of you want to become engaged today. Uh, uh, you know, so that is you know, so that that needs to change if you really want to benefit from anything more than just observing the, such a you know, such a webinar. But anyway, that is fine. I'm going to close the poll. Uh, the, the results of this poll show that uh, uh, you know the, that that the, that 30% uh, of you have PhDs, uh, you know, the ones who responded, and and then the others have you know, do not have PhDs. So I'm going to close that poll. And uh, and and then the the the, the then that is say uh, I'm just go share for a second. Uh, so you are, that is the result that we got. Uh, you know, but only half of you have voted. Uh, I'm going to quickly do another one. And 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 this in this time this time I'm go, I'm going to try to you know, I'm going to do one where you know, let's see. Uh, oops. Okay. Let's see. Uh, manage goals. Okay. Hide. Okay. Then we have manage. Then I've got to go. Oops. Okay, the next one is uh, is is on in, is, is the uh, uh, you know, is the one on uh, are, are, uh, do you have a PhD in the field of big data? You know, just getting some idea who who has got uh, in depth uh, uh, in in depth in the uh, in the field of big data. Please vote even if it is no. Okay, so you know, it's yes or no. So that's why we want to get some idea of what the audience looks like. Now, last time, 48% of you voted. I'd like to see a larger number vote. Okay, I'm just going to close the close the thing in about 10 seconds. Okay, this time fewer people voted for some reason, but anyway, the the number is uh, is quite small. Uh, yeah, okay, 43, 48 percent. Okay, the same number as, as last time is voted. Uh, so I'm going to close the poll and share it with you. Yeah, about 22 percent of you said a uh, few, just a few people have, yes, a few members of you. That means about uh, you know, two or three of you have, have a PhD in big data. Uh, and 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 then I'm going to hide that again. And, and uh, once again, I'm going to go and uh, try this one. Are you currently whether you whether you have a PhD or not? Are you currently doing research in big data? This is the other next poll. Doesn't matter whether you have a PhD or not. If you're doing research, you should say yes on this one. So several of you, you know, 23 percent of you voted. So several of you who may not have PhDs yet, but are working on the in the field of research, that is number is increased. So more than 60% of, of those who voted uh, are doing research in big data. Yeah, please go ahead and you know, be active. Okay, just click on the on the poll. You, know, you have to have interactivity. Okay, so we are waiting. I'll wait for another uh, 15 seconds for you to vote. Five seconds. Anybody wants wants to vote? I think fewer people have responded, but uh, about half of those who responded. That means about five of you are you know, actually doing research in the field of big data. Uh, so I'm going to close that and 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 share. Uh, so that so this so several of you are doing research in, in the field of big data. So let me just move on. And one last thing uh, is: uh, Are you willing to give a webinar based on your research in big data? Uh, yes or no? At least I've got one person you know, who has said yes, maybe two or three, maybe. Okay, I'm going to wait for another 15 seconds. See how many people will vote. You need to be active. See Community means you have, you have to be active. So about uh, more than half of you have not responded to the polls. Uh, so that is not a good sign you know, in my mind that, that this, uh, you know, in order to build a community, we need activity from the people. Uh, whether it's yes or no, it doesn't matter. You have to be active. And, and so, and so you know, research community, research cluster can only be built if we have a group active 
group of people. Uh, so I'm going to close that. So, so there's a few of you. Uh, those who have said that uh, that you're willing to give a webinar, please uh, send me an email, and 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 we will, uh, you know, uh, I think. So, okay. So I'm going to move on uh, back to uh, see the questions, and and see if I can, you know, I can uh, read out some questions here. Uh, let's see if I can go back to that screen and then look at the questions and then for two for just few two three minutes we'll go to the questions and then let you, you know, let you, uh, you know, move, move on with the with the webinar after that okay so a uh, question from um, uh, from uh, uh, Ripal Ranpara madam my research area is semantic research how can I use BCI interface in context of search engine uh, then uh, then it says is it possible to use it that is what she's uh, Ripal is asking Hardik Goel I'm working on big data and security that is good I'm using big data in my contextual research, semantic research. So those two comments, and so so uh, just now I'm going to give you back the screen. If you want to con uh, comment on that, that is fine. Otherwise, just keep going with the rest of your uh, presentation. Okay. Yes. Uh, and and I I will be with you for another 15, uh, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, and then I uh, let's see the takeover. Uh, so that uh, you know, I I have to go to another webinar. All right. So that go ahead. Yeah, I, you can show my screen. You can click show my screen. Um, I have done that, sir. Is it showing? Uh, yeah, let me just see. Maybe it is. Yeah, let me just see. Not yet. It is not time. I cannot see your screen. Waiting to view, it says. So maybe you have to. Ah, there. Now we can see. Yeah, now we can see. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, basically, big data technologies can be used for uh, uh, any purpose wherein the data is, uh, meets the four characteristics, which is volume, velocity, variety, and uh, uh, veracity. And uh, BCI data is basically used mostly in healthcare, wherein you capture the brain sick signals and try to analyze them to find out what are the uh, health issues a person uh, faces. Uh, moving on to uh, big data analytics on BCI data. Now let us look at how uh, BCI data looks like. So we'll have a look at sample uh, EG data. So th this is the website wherein you can uh, freely download publicly available EG data. EG stands for electroencephalograph and ERP is event related potential. I'll also show you the data that I have downloaded and processed. So the data that you download from the uh, website that I just uh, showed gets downloaded in this format, in the CNT and uh, dot, .adat and .exp format. You will be needing this tool called EEG Lab, which is a MATLAB uh, add-on to MATLAB software. EEG Lab can be downloaded. This is an open source MATLAB toolbox it is freely available for download once it is downloaded you can um, launch it so I've already launched uh, EEG lab and then you'll have to actually pre-process this data in order to read and I've already done that so I'll show you one such example Yes. So if you look at this data, it is the 31 electrode data. Like how we saw in the uh, presentation, you had FP1, FP2, F3, F4, C3. All of these are names of the electrodes which are placed at different parts uh, of your uh, head. And this is the data which is captured. This indicates the uh, uh, timestamp. And this is the uh, data. This is how uh, brain signal data would look like. This is 31 electrodes. You can go up to uh, 127 electrodes or 64 based on the capacity uh, of the EEG, uh, of the BCI uh, headset. There are several tools for processing EEG data. One of the tools is uh, EEG Lab, uh, which is uh, MATLAB dependent. And another toolbox is Field Trip, Open uh, BCI. There are a lot of tools available. So if you just Google the tools available for processing EEG data, you would get n number of tools. So now coming to revisiting the title of this uh, webinar, which is Design and Development of Prototypes for Non-Invasive BCI-Based Embedded Systems Without Using 
MATLAB. All of us know that MATLAB is basically matrix computations. So if I'm looking at trying to, uh, in real time, uh, do something with the brain signals, then backend processing cannot, we cannot use MATLAB as a tool for backend processing because there is a delay. For instance, that uh, mind control car demo that we saw, uh, in that we have not used MATLAB. Rather, we have used the uh, microcontroller and microprocessor the uh, Arduino as well as Raspberry Pi uh, board kits where, on which the processing happens. In this way, we have removed an additional interface of MATLAB, thereby uh, reducing the delay uh, gets incurred in case we use uh, MATLAB for processing brain signals. So my uh, current research focus is on developing prototypes for uh, non-invasive BCI-based embedded systems without using MATLAB. MATLAB provides several uh, functions which is very easy to use and you can actually, instead of writing low-level codes, we can go higher up and write more advanced codes, making use of the APIs and functions that MATLAB provides. But there is a disadvantage. Whenever these uh, MATLAB functions are used or MATLAB as a toolbox is uh, software is used, there's a lot of delay which is incurred due to processing. This can be eliminated by uh, using other uh, softwares or by trying to run the uh, program on the uh, board or microcontroller or the chip itself. In order to do that, we need to develop uh, functions or APIs. And that is my uh, goal of on the research for BCI. Once these APIs are developed and the data is captured, then I can make use of big data technologies for doing further uh, analytics. Now I'll just give an example of this mind-controlled car uh, that we developed and how I plan to use, uh, how I have made use of BCI concepts as well as what I plan to do in future uh, with respect to big data. So these are the references. This is not the first time that uh, a car, a toy car is being controlled through thoughts. Uh, Google has gone way beyond and uh, through Google I think uh, nano car, uh, Tata Nano is now uh, thought controlled so that is the extent. Uh, toy controlled cars, there are several uh, uh, do-it-yourself uh, tutorials and videos available online on how you can yourself uh, do uh, implement and plug in a toy controlled toy car and mind control it. So these are some of the web references. So what we did was we this ABC TC2 is the tentative name that we have given to our proposed system. At each step uh, during the implementation of uh, mind control call, car by us, we took uh, different ways uh, in order to ensure that the throughput response time and the delay is uh, reduced. So if I look at the three previous existing systems, the data stream used, we have used attention and all the others too have used. Meditation, none of them have used. Only we have used meditation to control the car. And raw EEG to calculate blink strength, only we have used. And then mind control functions. Among the three existing systems that we have compared as of today, only our system is able to control the car in all uh, right, left, forward, backward, and stop. I think uh, there is one, yes. Uh, BCBIL is only able to uh, control, thought control the car through backward, forward and stop uh, motions. And then a type of hacking, there are two ways of doing it. One is you hack open the toy car itself and then you uh, uh, connect it to the uh, NeuroSky headgear or you hack, I mean, open the NeuroSky head or the BCI head and directly connect it to the toy car. By doing so, we lose on the warranty of the uh, a headset that we have purchased. So what we have taken is we have taken a different approach wherein we neither hack the NeuroSky uh, uh, headgear or do we make any major modifications to the uh, RC of the car. So we did not hack the BCI headset. We did not hack the remote of the car and we only hack the car circuitry. So that means once uh, we put back the car, we still will be able to operate the car through the remote. And now the car type and circuitry used, we have, uh, there are there are uh, tutorials which are available on building the car from the scratch. We have not done that. I went and purchased a toy car, which is remote controlled from a nearby mall, and then we started working on it. So car obtained off the shelf, yes. And then no involvement of transistors and resistors. Uh, even though we are from computer science, we did a lot of research on using minimal transistors and resistors for accomplishing this. Whereas the other uh, three methods have used uh, 
uh, transistors and resistors and then use of power bank instead of battery so we faced a lot of problem with <coughs> batteries out very quickly uh, for testing purposes so we instead of using a battery connected it to the uh, power bank the processing side uh, if you notice mtcm uh, does the processing uh, does not do the processing on uh, arduino and it does it rather on the computer or the cloud but we are doing the processing on arduino and it is computer independent so when a scoring system was done on it we saw that our system abtc2 gets the highest score as compared to the three existing uh, systems we are yet to compare with the other uh, existing system so this is how uh, simple analytics can be performed on the example which is mind controlled uh, car now the data that is being generated can be analyzed using uh, several big data technologies so i'll show you some of the technologies that we can use for analyzing the brain data one such technology is called splunk so splunk is a big data technology which can be used for analyzing machine generated data so any machine data it can be analyzed using a splunk so there are several solutions available that you can we can explore on using splunk for analyzing data this does not involve much of development but splunk also has another variant called hunk which is hadoop for analyzing big data now going back to the slide uh, looking at some of the research directions on bci using big data technologies So this is a paper which was published in uh, IEEE uh, Transactions on Neural Systems. So this uh, paper uh, actually gives you a lot of this published article gives you a lot of information on what are the real time challenges which are uh, faced in the field of uh, BCI. BCI is very important for paralyzed people who are unable to speak. So through their thought signals they will be able to control objects around them. it is also important for understanding uh, what are the issues that a person faces as i have already indicated if there are multiple electrodes which are placed on the brain and the data is captured then you can actually know if the person is having any heart problem or is he predict in advance whether he is he will get any disease and so on and so forth so the main challenges that uh, bci is uh, field we are working on and i also look at some of the uh, challenges in the uh, area of big data which is published by intel so big data advances in healthcare examine the value of big data utilization in the japanese healthcare category and then you have uh, predictive uh, predictive analytics rescue hospital hospital readmissions this is a use case shows see how intel and cloudera are using predictive analytics to help identify patients at high risk for readmission so this can also b uh, bci can also be used for this purpose and then predictive analytics reduce patient length of stay use case see how intel and cloudera are using predictive analytics to help accurately predict discharge dates so on and uh, so food so this is some of the research directions on uh, big data so if you just uh, google and research directions on bci or big data you'll get plenty of uh, directions on which we can go ahead That's it i think this is all i have to say thank you any questions hello hi yes ma'am one minute is it possible to associate bci and big data for cancer treatment yes um eeg uh, there's something called as artifacts uh, artifacts can be categorized into uh, uh, environmental artifacts physiological artifacts and various other types of uh, artifacts uh, eeg data has the potential of capturing large amount of information 
what we actually do in the case of BCI is uh, we focus on what is it the information that is required. So that information is retained and the other is taken as noise and removed. This is done in the pre-processing stage. So yes, it is possible to identify the risk of cancer through the use of BCI, big data and in particular in big data using the machine learning uh, analytics or techniques. I'm not sure if uh, this was asked before. Could big data be used in computational astronomy? I, I didn't uh, get up. Can you please repeat the question? Could big data be used in computational astronomy? Um, I think yes, it can be used because the data again generated is, uh, uh, comes under the category of volume. Yes, it can be used. Big data can be used in any field wherein the data is either large, very large, it cannot be processed by a traditional database management system. The definition of big data itself says that data that cannot be uh, processed by traditional uh, DBMs, database management systems, comes to the category of uh, big data. Hadoop, uh, Apache Hadoop, which is a big data technology, should be used in case the traditional uh, uh, systems and softwares fail to process the data or take more amount of time to process the uh, data. So that definition itself says that in case you're not able to uh, process the data within a given time and it is uh, too cumbersome, tedious, then you should we should adopt, uh, go for Apache Hadoop, which is a big data technology. Can you give an example of what kind of machine learning techniques can be used for cancer detection? Okay, uh, machine learning is categorized in under two heads. One is supervised learning, the other is uh, unsupervised uh, learning. Um, under supervised learning, you have a logistic regression and then linear regression and all of that coming. Unsupervised, you have neural networks, uh, support vector machines and all. For uh, cancer, in case you want to know if a, stu if a patient is uh, t the uh, cells, cancer cells, are the uh, cells are cancerous, benignant or not, then in that case, uh, neural networks would be the best choice. It basically depends on the number of parameters that you take into consideration. Or also you can use support vector uh, machines. Both are very suitable for uh, trying to analyze, uh, to know if the patient is, has cancerous cells or not. Is, is non-invasive BCI-based embedded systems without using MATLAB compatible with Watson for oncolo oncological technology in detective cancer? Um, to some extent, yes, we can use non-invasive uh, BCI. The motive epoch uh, with uh, 31 or 64 electrodes that can be used for uh, capturing EEG data and then uh, you can actually uh, filter out a lot of noise and then basically analyze what uh, there's a lot of research which has happened on using non-invasive BCI and trying to predict if a person would get cancer in future or not or what is the probability of a person uh, having cancer and all of that so that information is there what I have understood as of now is the EEG uh, data captures a lot of information and once you the more number of electrodes you use for capturing the data the more uh, data it con contains and that data can be filtered out you the electrodes are actually mapped as in if I have to say that for attention I need to use FP1 and F3 F4 electrodes so if I am capturing data from uh, so many electrodes then I only have to focus on these and there's also a technique called as independent component analysis so uh, ICA is a mathematical uh, technique through which you can filter out the non-required data and keep only the required data. So it is possible to um, detect cancer using non-invasive BCI and I have, I remember reading several articles which are already published on using emotive headset in order to do that. Those were all the questions, man. Thank you. Thank you.